Hi, uh, I'm Brian Drury. I will be talking about improving the FreeBSD build. I am a committer with FreeBSD. I work for EMC Isilon. Um, so what, what brought me to work on all of this stuff? Uh, at Isilon, we have many developers that, uh, you know, we're doing build world quite a lot and it, build world can be quite painful for how long it takes to build. You're building a lot of things this, uh, twice, the incremental build doesn't actually work. You have to clean everything before you build. Um, but if you're a user land developer on a team that's working on a very small tool, you don't really want to wait several hours to build everything just to see if your change works. Uh, likewise, if you're a kernel developer, maybe you don't really want to wait 10 minutes for the kernel. You want to build in seconds or minutes. Uh, my background is in I came to the project through the ports project, and I've worked on Pujier, which is the parallel build system for ports. Uh, I never really thought I'd be working on the base build system, but through the need at work and them willing to sponsor all of this work, I jumped into it and have been working on it for six to seven months now. And I'm very thankful to uh, EMC Islon for providing that. So I will be going over how the build currently works because that's important context for why the improvements matter. Uh, improvements to the build, all of which are already committed into FreeBSD, so they're all in 11. Planned improvements, and what I'd like to call a wish list of things that a lot of us want, but maybe are not feasible to do. So overall, the build is a recursive build system. Uh, there's just very small component make files in each directory and make will iterate over a list of subdirectories uh, such as in bin or lib, go into each of those directories, build that thing in that directory, and then go into another directory and build. There's no dependency system in the FreeBSD build when you're building from subdirectories. Uh, Something we added in the 10.0 time frame was subdir parallel, which allows building multiple directories at once. I'll talk about that a little bit further on the next slides. And for build world, we added in a dependency graph for build world using these uh, underscore L targets that I have down here. These allowed building a dependency graph of all the directories that we're going to build where the order matters and then we build those directories in the, the proper order. And a term that I will use a lot in this presentation is, is a tree walk, and that's where we are going into every directory in the tree and building in that directory. So for the subdir parallel, the historical build on the left would just go into one directory at a time. Uh, if, you, if you ran with make J4, four jobs, it would run make J4, in each directory individually, wait until that was done, and then go into the next directory. On the right, I have an example of what subdir parallel does. And the, the J example is not entirely accurate, but it's, it's good enough for this discussion. It will build in multiple directories at once and split the available jobs up between each directory. <coughs> so the, the targets for building FreeBSD are build world, build kernel, and universe. Build world is just used for building user land. It's the only reliable way to build anything in FreeBSD as opposed to going into a subdirectory and typing make because it won't build any of the dependencies it needs. Uh, build kernel, so build world is a recursive make build while build kernel, ignoring the modules, is, not, is a non-recursive make build that is actually quite efficient. It knows all of the objects that it's going to build builds them all in one dependency graph, uh, works nice and parallel, and it's, it's fairly efficient. And make universe is used for doing build world and build kernel across all architectures that FreeBC can build for. So for build world, there's this thing called a minimum supported release, at least that's what I will be calling it. And what that means is that you can only build FreeBSD from FreeBSD on a minimum release. 
So up until a few days ago, our head claimed that you could build from 8.0, but in reality, you can only build from around the 9.1 time frame. And I've recently fixed that. Uh, we support a cross build, which means that you can build binaries for an architecture that you are not actually running. Uh, and that means that we must build all of the build tools for the host that we will be running. And I'm using some color schemes on the next few slides. Um, so back here I had tree walks in red. I will be showing several red things that are tree walks. And then for the host and target builds, I used a color scheme of green for host and orange for the target. Because there's a lot of things that are being built twice once for the host and once for the target. For the target build, it's building what's called a sysroot, where we stage all of the headers and libraries that need to be used to build the target binaries into a staging directory. And then anytime you do a linking or you're searching for headers from the compiler, you look in that sysroot for the libraries and headers as opposed to the host system libraries and headers. And that's, this is used even if you're not doing a cross build because you want to build with the new headers and new libraries as opposed to what you have on your host system. And a target build typically will use a tool chain that is tailored for the target build. This has the, the default architecture built in, the default sysroot built in. So you can build for MIPS code from x86 system. Uh, so now I'll go over the actual steps in build world that are currently there. The first several steps are several bootstrapping steps. The first is make a legacy, which builds a very small compatibility library that allows building from previously 9.1 currently. It adds in functions that are required by later build tools that are not in the older release. So something like uh, strviz, stringviz, this is something that we've only added in the past few years in FreeBSD, but FreeBSD 9.1 doesn't have it, but a build tool might rely on it. So we need to provide a small library that has these functions and headers to build our host tools without making our host tools uh, you know, bare minimum. We want to use the new functions we add in the libc. So that's building for the host. And that's very quick. You don't even notice that usually in the build. It's like five seconds. The next is bootstrap tools. And this is just building more tools that will be used to support the minimum supported release. And then next is a tree walk of make clean, unless you're using the no clean flag. This goes through and deletes everything you've already built in the past, since we do not have an inc a working incremental build. So you end up rebuilding everything, even if you changed one little file in bin sh, for example. You could use Dino Clean to skip cleaning everything, but very often you will hit errors in the output or build errors because they don't rebuild when the compiler changes, they don't rebuild when CSU or CRT change, they don't rebuild when the tools change. There's a, a lot of cases where things are just not rebuilding. Next is another tree walk of make object. Remember, a tree walk goes through every directory in the tree, and this is Create, this is just doing a make dir uh, in the object directory for every directory we're building in. Next is build tools. And this is uh, a specialized tree walk that goes through in every directory and looks for build tools target and builds those. There's only about eight directories in the entire tree that we do a build tools target for. Um, it's not quite a tree, rock, tree walk. We have just hard coded these eight directories for it to visit. And these are things like uh, in bin sh, there's a thing called make syntax that gets ran, that just generates some headers for bin sh. Or in ncurses, it also generates some files during the build. So these, these are host tools that we need to build early that we will run later to actually generate the target binaries. And then next is cross tools. And this is the longest step in the, the bootstrapping step. This is actually building the entire tool chain that is for the target. It's building a cross clang or a cross GCC that has the default sysroot built into it, which we call, call world temp. Um, this also builds bin utils, elf tool, tool chain. This is 
Later on, we build Clang again for the target. So we're building Clang twice. Next is make includes. This is a full tree walk that just goes through and installs all of the headers that anything might have into the sysroot so that later things that need these new headers can get them without referencing the tree. So you can have a uniform uh, you know, user include path instead of adding C flags and dash I's for uh, every, every little thing in the tree. And then we do make libraries. And this has some tree walks in it, but it has four separate phases to itself. And each one of them is kind of bootstrapping itself up to building all the libraries in the system. This, this particular phase of the build has been very confusing for people that add new libraries. Pretty much anybody who adds a new library, including myself, is going to do this wrong. At least, at least one thing will be wrong here. Um, so prereq libs is things like libc and compiler RT. Startup libs are some more of those. And eventually, we get to generic libs, which does a tree walk for all of lib. But in some of these earlier phases, there are these L targets that are used to build the dependency graph that I mentioned earlier. And that's where it really trips people up. Those L targets are, are only for creating a dependency graph. And then next, it runs through and run, runs make depend on the entire tree. And again, this is the historical build, say 10.0. Things have changed since 11, which I'll get to. But this is, this is running make dep, which is just cc e on. In all of the directories, it generates headers, generates other files, some source files get generated. But these dot .depend files that get generated are used for clean parallel builds so that C files know which headers they need to build. And then it's also later on used for incremental builds. Even though incremental builds don't work, we still have these. And they can be useful if you are building in just one little directory and you, you've modified one header and uh, only what you've changed had being impacted will re rebuild. Next is make everything. This is a, the final tree walk that just goes through and runs make all on the entire tree, which also builds many of the libraries, again, because it's a full tree walk. These libraries, because they've already built, they're not really building again, but they are getting visited again, so there's a lot of overhead in that. And then finally, for x86, PowerPC and ARMv6, there's a libcompat phase. It's actually lib32 on PowerPC and x86 and libsoft on ARM. And this is just building compatibility libraries. It's going and building all of the libraries targeting the 32-bit version of that platform or the, the soft, float, soft float version of that platform. That's, that's the entirety of build world. There's a few small things in there I didn't mention that don't matter too much. And then for installing, uh, obviously these are tree walks. Make install world, installs the user land, and install kernel, and installs the kernel and modules. Before I move on, are there any questions about the current build? Angie? The comment was that there's also a make distribution for installing. Yes, I, I didn't mention it because I haven't, I haven't touched that really, but make distribution is used for installing all of the config files. Install world doesn't typically install config files. You don't want to blow away your master password file and, and other config files. So you use something more like uh, Etsy update or merge master to you install these into a staging area and then compare them to your tree. Any other questions or comments? So the first big improvement is DIRDEPS build. And I won't talk about this too much because Simon Garrity has already talked about this in 2014 at BSD CAN. It was merged into the tree in 2015 at BSD CAN. It was originally called with meta mode, but that has been re renamed to DIRDEPS build so that meta mode could mean other things, which I'll talk about later. It is really the ideal build. It's non-recursive. It adds makefile.depend files in every directory of the tree that says what this directory depends on to build. So you can either go into a subdirectory and type make, or from the top level type make uh, all, or whatever your pseudo target is, and it will open up the makefile.depend, C 
see everything that it depends on, and then with one make process, recursively include all of the makefile.depend files that it, it needs, building the entire dependency graph of what directories are needed. And then from there, in the next make level, it actually starts building everything that you need to build. This avoids all of the, the bootstrapping, uh, all of the overhead, all of the tree walks is much faster. There is a there is a bootstrap tools phase of this that does utilize all the other bootstrapping, but it's pretty fast anyhow. Um, the big problem with this build, where it may not make sense as a default for us, uh, for FreeBSD, is that it doesn't handle optional dependencies very well. The FreeBSD build has uh, 60 or so options where you can enable or disable what you want to build and what you want to install. And some of these can have wide impact on the tree and their dependencies. Makefile.depend is a static list of dependencies. We have strategies for, use, for having optional dependencies, but there's a lot of work that we need to go into supporting all of it. Um, but ignoring that problem, DirtUp's build is incredibly useful for vendors who are not changing their options because they can generate their makefile.depend files and not worry about them changing going forward because they're, they're automatically generated after you build. Using uh, the FileMod module, it goes through and sees what you use to build. So uh, at Isilon, we will be using the DirtEps build because it's, it's much simpler, especially for building in subdirectories. You don't need to do all of build world just to see if your library change and one little user line utility is fixed. Uh, the merge of this from Simon and Juniper brought in a lot of foundation and features that are incredibly useful for build world as well. And a lot of those are the foundation for my work. So uh, a small thing that's changed is now parallel install world and install kernel are safe. In the past, these were hard coded off and crazy things could happen. Uh, one problem that I, I envisioned would be a problem was if you have something installing somewhere that depends on a directory being created by something else, but the build actually uses uh, through uh, distributors will extract M trees and create all the directories for you. So generally when something's installing, its directory should already be present because you should add the directory into the M tree. So for install world, the next concern is installing libraries in the correct order. You don't want to, well, first of all, install world will use a cached static, ver I think they're static, version of the install tools. So CP, install, awk, it's just, there's a whole list of like 15 tools that are used for the install. And these are copied to a small chroot. It's not a chroot, but it's copied to a small area that is, uh, and all the libraries are copied there so that when you're installing something, it doesn't suddenly use one of the new libraries and break things. But still, you want to ensure that RTLD is installed first, then libc, then pthread, uh, and go up the dependency order of libraries when you're installing things so you don't break anything running on the current system. This is mostly okay with the libraries, and it's actually better than not using parallel install world for libraries. When subdir parallel went in and the library make file was updated to support subdir parallel. The ordering of the libraries that had been safe for 30 years was changed so uh, that we could have parallel subdirs. And it was not really considered that changing the order of that may actually break installs. No one's reported errors with that, but um, with parallel subdir, or sorry, subdir parallel, we do have a mechanism called subdir depend where we can say that in this particular directory, these two subdirectories depend on this subdirectory. So uh, in the lib make file, you can say that libc depends on lib compiler RT or libc static or whatever. So that the things it depends on for install world will get installed first if you're using parallel. That doesn't apply for non-parallel though, and that's something that I am going to fix. So something I did to improve all of the tree walks in build world is called standalone targets. And this is where subdir parallel is, I should mention first that subdir parallel is an opt-in mechanism. 
if you want your directory to use it, you have to put subder parallel equals in your makefile. So lib makefile by default was not subder parallel safe. We had to add subder parallel in there and add some dependency lines. Uh, but for standalone targets, all of these targets here, uh, including clean, includes, object, are now always subder parallel. So even if lib makefile wasn't parallel safe, if you're running object on it, it would run object across all the directories at once or in parallel. That, that helps a lot with the tree walks and build world. Uh, and then if you're using dno root, which is used for building a mtree file for images and building is non-root, then make install is also parallel because uh, without any consideration for dependencies. So everything just, just runs without dependency ordering. Uh, that's safe for non-root because you know you're not running any of the binaries you're installing as non-root. Uh, this list is defined in bsc subdir.make and if as a downstream vendor you have a target you know is safe to run in parallel, you can just add it to the standalone targets list in your make.conf. At Isilon, we have several targets that are safe to always run in parallel. Uh, so the first major feature that I added was Ccache build. And Ccache is a tool that will save the object file from your com compilation. And then later, if you're compiling the same source file and headers with the same compiler, it will reuse that object file from its cache. It uses uh, several different methods for determining whether things changed, including m times and content hashes. There's, there's really no risk to using Ccache. There's been problems in the past, but it's, it's been fine. I haven't noticed any problems. Um, so why, why, did our, why, did our, why do we need this in the build as opposed to just setting Ccache and CC or path has been recommended before? Uh, Ccache doesn't cache any of the preprocessor files. It doesn't cache assembled files, and it doesn't cache linked files. So calling Ccache for all of those parts of the build is just a waste of time. It, it, wait, it, it takes the stats lock on its cache, updates the stats, it's just doing things it doesn't need to do. So with the Ccache build feature, Ccache is just skipped for areas it's not needed. This really only improves the build for a broken incremental build or an overly aggressive incremental build. And by what I mean, what I mean by that is because our incremental build is broken and we are doing make clean for every build, Ccache really helps in that case because you're just taking objects right from the cache that where nothing that compiled them have been impacted. Of course, there's still some problems, like I mentioned build tools, but overall Ccache really helps with incremental builds. And for an overly aggressive incremental build, I mean where the incremental build actually worked, but perhaps it rebuilt things more often than it really needed to, then Ccache would still help in that case. Uh, Ccache is, so here's some stats I took. For each of these runs, I did three, three builds on, on each of them. This took quite a long time. Uh, Ccache is about 20% slower to populate the cache compared to a normal build. This is copying files to the object, doing extra hashes. But when the cache is full, it's 51% faster of a, of a build. So this is just doing a, a build, then doing a clean, then building with a full cache. So it was 51% faster. You would think it would be 90% plus faster, but because of all the tree walks in the build and other overhead, it was only about 51%. With the next feature I'll talk about, fast depend, I got this up to 66% faster. Any questions? So fast depend. Uh, historically, make dip I, I, I talked about all of this already. Uh, so make depend would generate these dot depend files that are used for incremental builds and clean parallel builds. But when you don't have a depend file, it doesn't know what objects depend on which headers. And so we actually have these um, these extra dependencies that have been defined where we apply for all objects, they depend on all headers because nothing in the build would generate the headers historically if you had generated headers or generated files because you had to run make depend to generate all these. So we had these 
kind of hack in there. Um, there's also this thing called DP sources, where you would put generated files. This feature was added and then removed in the early 2000s, and then it came back as a hack for something. And then once it came back, it was widely abused, and people put just anything that was generated in this list. And this list, now I think there's one use in the entire tree. It's, it's generally just not needed. Uh, you can add headers into the sources list. Uh, sources is the list of files you want to link into your build target, and headers don't link, so it's fine. But if you have a generator file that's used only for generating something that does get linked, you don't want that in sources. In that case, it can go in DP sources. But usually, if you just add proper dependencies, that's, that's fine, too. Uh, the depend file also contains static dependencies. So if you're building binsh or, or cat, and it depends on the static libc, you want to relink re that program if your static libraries change. So now fast depend, how does this work now? There's no more make depend tree walk in the tree. Uh, this is using GCC 3.0 era M flags from 2002 or 2003, I think. So it's been a long time coming. This generates the depend files as a side effect of compilation using .depend.target files. And uh, so the, when you go and just like make in a directory, there's no depend file there to tell it how to build everything for a clean parallel build. So all that had to be cleaned up. But a lot of that work was already done by Simon for the dirt apps build. Uh, I took that step further and really made everything in the tree safe for a clean build for parallel. So now these depend files are only useful for incremental builds. Um, through some feedback of performance on NFS, I tested not generating these files to see if, if it would have any impact. And it really was, it was like 1% time to not generate them. So there's, there's really no harm to just generate them anyway. Uh, something I missed earlier was that by doing make depend before, we were running the preprocessor on all source files to just generate this depend file. And then later when we compiled, we ran the preprocessor again internally to generate the object output. So in the build, we were running the preprocessor twice. And that's, that's why you see here it saves about 16% time, because we removed an entire tree walk of running the preprocessor. Uh, so to generate the dependencies in a clean build, internally there's this before build hook that will run the make depend target before it builds anything. And that, because it's not generating a depend file, all it really does is depend on all the sources. So if a source is generated, it just generates it at that point. And the depend files are still used for static dependencies. There's, there's no other way around that. For build kernel, this saved 35% time. It, it's really noticeable in the kernel and libc. And other, if you, if you have a downstream vendor, you might have other things that have hundreds of files in them that took a long time for makedep to run across. Uh, the problem with makedep was that it would run makedep and then the entire list of source files you had. So if you had 100 source files in one directory, these were all being processed by one CC execution. I experimented with paralyzing this, but overall it did not help compared to this system. In some cases it actually slowed down for some reason. So these MM flags are only applied in cases where make depend generated something in the past. Uh, so like the CSU build in GNU lib CSU, it has both sources and objects defined, which means that in the old make depend scheme, it never actually ran make dep across the objects that it's generating. And so if you actually do run the dependency if you do generate a dependency file for all of the objects in that directory, it would then create these uh, target.o, uh, you know, it'd be csu.a or whatever, .o, uh, colon, crt.c. Uh, so that would get added into the depend file, and then on the next build, because the make file already had that exact rule, you would get the source file added in twice, and the compiler would, would build, would complain that it had two inputs. 
I easily could have just fixed that makefile, but this feature is enabled for the entire BSD build system, including ports and downstream vendors, and I wanted to ensure that I didn't break the same thing for other people. So I made this behave how make depend would have de behaved. So if it's not in objects, p objects, us objects, depend objects, or depend sources or sources, pretty much it doesn't get a depend file. There's still some extra work that needs to go into that. Uh, and so the, this objects, uh, this objects line here, you really only want to use this when there's no depend file already. And so I've renamed this to be objects depend guess or objects depend guess.target.o. And so in some places in the tree, there, these variables are used to add a dependency to a target only when its depend file doesn't yet exist. Because you don't want to add in double dependencies or make everything depend on a header when really it doesn't. And this is part of the effort to make, uh, make all safe without having a depend file. Uh, some older implementations of this kind of feature, there's, there's several. We had one at work and uh, Simon has one. Uh, some older implementations of this used a for loop in the depend file to then include all the depend files. And that is significant because uh, I'm sure you've all seen the ignoring stale dependency from the depend. And what that is is when there's a file in a dependency list that cannot actually be found Normally, you'll get make telling you that it doesn't know how to build that file. But if it's in a .depend file, it's a special case and it just gets ignored. And that's, that's very important for when your last build depended on a file that has now moved somewhere else. You don't want that file breaking your build. You want it to just be ignored and you want that to cause a rebuild because that file's gone and something's changed. So instead of having the include inside of .depend, which would require generating all these depend files all over the tree. I worked with Simon, the, uh, the, uh, the maintainer of vMake, to add in this deinclude feature, which brings in all of that, that same logic for the depend.target.o files. As I mentioned, DP sources is not really needed anymore. What you really should do is just add proper dependency lines in the makefile. These are very rare anyhow. Uh, all the sources are added in, should be added into the sources list that they're just generated. The removal of the make depend tree walk did not harm anything in the FreeBSD tree, but it did harm something in the Isilon build. It's probably going to be pretty rare. The specific case that I ran into was that a make file was generating a make file containing generated sources and then including that generated make file in its own make file. And that relied, it sounds silly, but it, it kind of makes sense for this tool. Um, so that relied on a two pass run of that, of that make file. And so now uh, you don't get that two pass run, you just get make all. So you'd have to avoid things like that. That's it for fast depend. Are there any questions about that? All right, moving on to system compiler. And this, is, sorry, Engie? Uh, really quick, are you going to actually prevent the uh, that uh, The question is, am I going to remove make depth? I have not removed make depth because it's, it's a tool that shipped with FreeBSD. I haven't seen a reason to remove it. But I did remove all of the old make depend code. So there's currently no way to go and generate these depend files without actually building. Um, someone did tell me the other day, and I didn't realize this really, uh, that I made it so that now when they type make, all these depend files get generated, and that, that never seemed to happen before, because you didn't run make depend. You should be running make object if you're building things. These depend files will go into the object directory. Uh, but I haven't removed make depth. It's, it can be useful. Uh, I haven't seen the need to re remove it. It's, it's a 30 line shell script. It's not really harming anything. Any other questions? All right, system compiler. This is opportunistically building Clang less, the cross compiler version of Clang. So recall that normally in the build, in build world, you would build a cross version of Clang and then you'd eventually build a target version of Clang. 
with the addition of the external toolchain support, this can be skipped though. Um, yeah, so in Make Universe, it's even worse. And usually vendors don't care about Make Universe, but FreeBSD developers do because they add something into the kernel or they add something to libc and they want to make sure it builds on x86 and arm and big endian and little endian. Uh, we have something like 15 architectures that we support. And so for make universe, you'd be building the cross compiler clang n times two times. And then you'd be building the target clang n times. And you really only need to build clang once. This, is, this opportunistically does that. Sometimes it still builds it. So why, why do we generally build a bootstrap version of Clang instead of just using the compiler you already have? Um, so for GCC, there's no easy way to say that the GCC I'm using is x86, but I want to build for ARM or MIPS. There's, I think there's some obscure flags you can use, but it's not, it's not simple. So that was a big reason that we always needed a bootstrap compiler. With Clang, you can actually tell Clang that you're building for a different architecture. And luckily, our user bin CC does, by default, have all the architectures that we support in it. So we can use that. But why not just use that one? Uh, obviously, major version upgrades. Clang is changing very quickly in the tree. We went from 3.6 to 3.7 to 3.8, all in the span of the 11 timeline, I believe. So when you update the Bootstrap compiler, you want everything in the tree to build with the new compiler. If you fix a bug in the compiler, it's generating the wrong code. You definitely want to rebuild everything. It can fix a very critical problem with the outputted stuff. Uh, if you add new C flags support that you now want to use for the entire build to enable some new feature, you obviously want the new compiler for that. And for reproducibility, to be able to check out the same version of the tree, you want the same output to always come out. So you don't really want to just use whatever compiler you have, happen to have sitting around. So the way this feature works is it compares the major version number of the compiler, which is an important thing, but it's not enough because you need a smaller revision for when you do make small changes such as adding new flags or fixing compiler bugs. So we already had this previous CCC version flag and the rule is just that if you're changing, downstream needs to know this too, vendors, if you're changing the compiler in any way, adding new features to it, then you need to bump this version, which I'll, I'll have on the next slide where we can find that. Or if you're adding new target support, uh, I think we recently added RISC-V. So if you're adding new target, you also need to bump the version to ensure that you're using a compiler that can build the, the thing you want to build later on. So if, if the major version number matches and the CC version, FreeBSD CC version matches what's in the tree compared to the running compiler, then the default compiler of CC, which maps to user bin CC, is used as an external compiler. So this is really utilizing all of the work that's, that's gone into there from Brooks and Baptiste. This uses the target and sysroot flags for Clang. Uh, because the sysroots needed to make sure you're building against the, the new headers and libraries and world temp. As I said, GCC does not support the target flag. So if you're on a platform that's using GCC, then this feature only works if you're building for your native architecture. It'll still skip building GCC, but only for your native architecture. GCC is relatively fast to build compared to Clang, so it's not as big of a problem. This is a different feature than without cross compiler without cross-compiler, always skips building the cross-compiler and just uses whatever you happen to have sitting around. That too also uses the external compiler logic in 11. But if you're, as I said before, if your user bin CC is playing 3.6 and you're trying to build the tree and it expects 3.8, you're, it's, it's not reproducible. You're not going to get the output that's expected and you're likely going to get build errors. So this feature, this without cross-compiler is useful but you should be very cautious using it. You should really only use it if your major version number matches and you know that there's no bug fixes in the compiler that you really care about. So the actual version in the tree or stored in these files, um, if for some reason you need to know about that, you 
this can be used as a reference. It's also in the, the commit logs. But to get this from the <coughs> running compiler, I just run the preprocessor against previous CCC version, trim out all of the comments and line numbers that come with that, and grab the number. It's relatively fast. And bsd.compiler.make, which we have for looking up the version of the compiler and what kind of compiler it is, was already primed for looking up this information. So now it also looks up this version if needed. Any questions about this feature? All right, so ob automatic object directory creation. This is the one feature I will talk about that's not, at least for build world, not committed yet. All of the, the work for it is already in the tree. The dirt apps build uses it, but I have not yet adapted it to build world. There's several things that need to happen still. Uh, the idea behind this is that if you go under directory and type make, it'll just automatically create your object directory. And that avoids getting into problems where you forget to run make object or you didn't know you had to run make object and now you're using files from the object tree from build world and from your local source directory. Uh, and that, that can easily err. And so um, automatic object directory creation will be a great thing. For build world, it'll take away one of the tree walks as well. We don't need to go and type make object in every directory anymore. We can just create the object directory as we visit it to do something else like includes or libraries or make all. Uh, another thing that'll come with this change is changing the default object directory. So historically, for FreeBSD, we've used a default prefix of user object. And if you're building from user source, then you would get object files in user object, user source, and then the directory name that you built in. And if you're cross compiling, it would go to user object and then the target. So, you know, amb64 dot amb64 slash user source and then the directory. So if you run make universe, you get object directory spread all over user object from the same directory tree. So, um, the dirt ups build already uses this pattern, and I, I'm going to extend this to the rest of the, tr the tree, mostly build world since it's the one that uses this stuff, so that you will always have user object, user source, and then the target architecture, and then the directory that you're building in. And that way, if, you, if you're maintaining multiple checkouts, which um, it, a lot of us do, and you want to clean up all the objects just from this tree, you're done testing this tree, you can easily just remove user object, user source two or source three or whatever, and you know you're really removing all the objects, and you didn't just accidentally remove your PowerPC object directory, which, which covered 10 different source trees, and it allows you to keep these for everything. And it's just a much better organization. Yes? Yes, make object or prefix will still be in there. It just will default to user object still. Uh, other question was, will you keep make object or prefix? Warner? Is, is this change in the release notes? Is this change in the release notes? It should be. It's not in 11.0. It didn't make the cut. Okay. If you go and type with auto object equals yes, make build world, bad things will probably happen. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't need to enable additional options. Right. But. Right, uh, and if you go into a subdirectory, this does work. You can, but you have to type with auto object equals yes. And this is something that came in with Simon's dirt apps build uh, merge. So that works. It doesn't use any of the new uh, directory prefixes yet in a subdirectory. Uh, there's already all of this logic for dirt apps that I'm going to move to just apply for everything. When it goes in, this will break. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that people need to know about it because some people know how to understand it. The comment was that it needs to be documented in the release notes because it'll likely break people's build systems if it's on by default. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I, if, if, you have, if you have specific examples of where that will break something, I'd love to, to get that from you later. Oh, so the, the path change is, is so going problematic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. 
<laughs> but no, just yeah. just, just so people know. Yeah, I, I, all, that, all the other stuff is little things here and there that might bite somebody here and there. But I think this will hit a lot of people. I I agree actually. Uh, I I think we just it's it's a better long term change. It just needs to be communicated well. Exactly. Did you have a question, Will? Sorry, could you repeat the first part? Yes. Yes, the idea was to always put the target in the object directory even if you're not doing a cross build. Because then it would be a lot, it's, it's, because otherwise you'll have uh, your native stuff in your object directory and then you'll have all these target dot things spread around the tree too. And those might, We can talk about this more later. Is there another comment? Um, this, is, this will be very useful. I can build world mist in, on AMD64 and install world mist on the mist platform or Cisco disk mm. um, without ugly, ugly hacks, hmm. um, which will make my life easier. So okay. I, that's one reason I like mist. I like it. <coughs> Anything else? All right, so now I'm going to take a, a small detour and explain FileMon, a kernel module that uh, John, the late John Burrell committed in 2009. It also comes from Juniper, and it was part of John Burrell's uh, JBuild system, uh, which I think evolved into DirtUps. I'm not entirely sure on all the history. But FileMon is used to track all of the files that are read, written, or executed from a process. Uh, this can be used to track, track dependencies. Uh, it's very similar to the GCC flags for fast depend, but it does it for everything. You can use uh, a C API, you can use the script command, and bmake also recognizes it. And it creates a log. You can, here's an example log, it's not completely accurate, but it shows that we executed bin sh, read standard io.h, and then wrote sh.full. And this information is very useful for, for bmake. Uh, there's an example here for how you can actually run it. Over the past few years, uh, there were a lot of stability problems and performance problems with this module, but a lot of work has gone into it over the past year, and I consider it stable, secure, and performant now, and safe to use. Right, so some of the changes that were made in it is, originally it would loop on the process tree, so it hooks into syscalls to watch for these file operations. And when it would intercept one of these syscalls, it would loop on the process tree to see if this process is being traced. That was very bad for performance. So now the file mon data is stored in the struct proc for the process. This change makes the module not self self hosted or self reliant. You cannot. Uh, just drop it in another tree and use it. You have to make a change to uh, sysproc, but it's worth it because it really helps the performance. Uh, a lot of races were fixed. There was very little error handling that's all fixed up. There's uh, credential handling fixes. Some of the stuff that's still left to do is to replace the syscall hooking either with event handler, which needs its own improvement work because it's, it's very badly implemented currently with some global blocks or to add a new syscall tracing framework. Uh, this is work I will look into eventually. And currently you cannot unload it. So it's very useful for the work that I'll explain currently, but you cannot unload it unless you use the dash F flag to KLD unload. Because it's hooking syscalls, if you happen to be running one of the syscalls in the module and you unload the module, now you're running code that's no longer present. So you, have, you can unload it as long as your, your system's pretty idle. And there's a few at functions that are not implemented or uh, that are missing or implemented improperly. So bmake meta mode. This is something else that Simon presented in 2014 at PSDCAN. And this is activated internally by doing dot make mode equals meta. And this, this 
allows having an incremental build without cleaning anything, it creates a meta file for every target that's built, and that contains the command that was ran, the current working directory, uh, and then if you have FileMon loaded, it also stores all of the FileMon data for that execution. I have an example coming up for that. Uh, and so then on the next build, it will open up the meta file, and there's, there's a detailed list here for what changes, but pretty much if any of the files that are read, written, or executed have changed, the target will rebuild. And if the build command has changed, it also will rebuild. And this is very useful for if, using a, if you change CC to a different compiler, or you change your C flags, you want everything to rebuild, and now that'll happen with bmakes meta mode. Here's an example of a uh, .meta file for linking sh. It has the command that was used to link it, the directory it was ran from, the target that it was uh, built as, and then, I, this is truncated, it's much longer, but it has an example of the actual FileMon data in there. And those that has process IDs and timestamps for uh, a version of FileMon's protocol. So now we have a feature called meta mode with meta mode in the build. And this provides us a working incremental build. This too came in with Simon's merge, but a lot of extra work has gone into it over the past few months to make this work well with build world. And now I, I consider this stable. So this uses vmakes meta mode and FileMon to capture all of the stealth dependencies we have that uh, are very important for rebuilding and to rebuild for uh, command changes. So currently things like CSU and CRT are not added in depend files. I started working on fixing that. It became overly complex to make sure you didn't add dependencies when they weren't needed. Because CRT and CSU, they, uh, they're split up into like five different files and you use one if you're doing static, you use one if you're doing profile, you use one if you're using shared, you use one if you're using uh, pi. It's, it's all very complex. It, it, that, I abandoned that change. But there's a lot of other things in the build that are just simply not tracked currently, such as tools or the, the command output. So for this build mode, in build world, it, it always skips the clean tree walk. It keeps your objects around. Using d no clean doesn't, won't do anything. There is no d clean either. So if you really want to clean the build objects, you can do, do make clean world, and that'll clean out what you already have. This disables the fast depend feature. It just doesn't generate any depend files because the data is already captured in the meta files with FileMon. They're really just not needed. Uh, I mentioned earlier with the objects depend guess feature that it only adds those dependencies in if there's no depend file already. And this also considers whether there's a meta file. I'm going to speed up a little because I have too much content. So meta mode also enables the more terse output of just building blah instead of showing the full output. You can disable this with dash d no underscore silent. Uh, and then if you hit a build error, currently I don't have this enabled, but I, I'm going to enable it. You can, it'll tell you which meta file to look in for the build command, but you can just open the dot meta file for the target to see what the failed command was. Uh, something else with meta mode is it allows us to skip doing redundant things. Uh, you know, if you've already installed something to a staging directory, you can prevent installing it again because it's already there. And normally you want an install target to always run, so you don't want to create a cookie for an install target. But with meta mode, we can create a, a cookie for the install target because it can see what files were written. So if that file is missing, it knows to rerun it, and it knows if a source file has changed, it knows to rerun the target. And I just have some examples here of using a cookie. On the left is without meta mode, how we do things now, we always want to run the install target. On the right is an unsafe way to do an install. If you touch do install, now that target will never run again and you won't install these files. You don't want to do that. With meta mode, this, uh, on both of these, meta mode is enabled. The first thing we do is delete the cookie because Meta mode in vMake has detected we need to rerun this target. And if something fails in this target, we want to make sure we run it again. 
And so we have to remove the, the cookie so it's not orphaned and prevents running again later. Uh, I have a simple way called meta targets on the right that you can use to enable this, this cookie on any target. And this is something that I need to go and add into the tree. Um, this meta mode build can be a bit overly aggressive sometimes. Most of that has been fixed recently. Uh, the initial call for testing had a lot of bugs that are all fixed, such as doing a build world, install world, a build world would rebuild everything because your host changed. That's fixed now. Uh, there's about an eight minute build if nothing has changed. That's, that's all just overhead. Uh, this disables the system compiler feature, unfortunately, because if in the last build you were using the in-tree cross-compiler and now in the next build you're using the compiler you just installed, it's now going to add target and sysroot flags, which changes the build output, uh, the build command, and so now everything would have rebuilt. So I disabled that. Uh, there's more improvement for vMake coming for performance. A lot of things have actually already gone in in the past few days. There's a, a subtle bug with library linking that's being looked into. This will allow you to build incrementally head from head and after I MFC the changes, you'll be able to build head from stable 10 with file mine as well. And if you want to know why something's rebuilding, you can use the dash DM flag to see why it's rebuilding. Uh, I'm going to keep speeding along here. So a lot, of, a lot of small things have gone into the build over the past several months. I've added some extra build time assertions. I've cleaned up a lot of bit rot. I fixed some bugs in progs.make. Now if you are installing and a target has changed and it's trying to rebuild, that causes an explicit error as well. And if you're trying to install to a directory but the directory is missing, that now fails instead of creating a file as the directory name. That's, that's uh, a really simple fix, but we, personally we, we hit it a lot at Heisalon because people forgot to run make distributors after pulling in updates. There's more CXX support. BSC compiler.make is uh, more performant. I've added in cflags.source. So if you want to add a cflag just to one file, this feature was kind of spread around the tree. People were just kind of putting it everywhere. But now I've globalized it so you can use this everywhere. Uh, I brought in make analyze from NetBSD. This works for userland and the modules. Allows you running to, to run the Clang static analyzer. Uh, without cross compiler, without tool chain are now completely fixed. Those had subtle bugs. The external chain, tool chain has been expanded a lot. Uh, Subder parallel has been expanded a ton, so the build should generally be much faster. I'll take questions uh, at the end. So uh, another planned improvement I have uh, along the line of make or, uh, with system compiler is to make universe build clang once, always. That change really shouldn't be that hard. I plan to do that in the next few weeks. I want to add some external Clang toolchain packages. Uh, get auto object in, add more build time assertions, cleaning up a lot of the redundancy we have in, in, uh, in the tree. We have things that are defined twice in two different places, and I have a lot of ideas for that. I want to clean up the L uh, dependency graph chaos we have in makefile.inc1 and use some of the data and metadata we have already in the tree. I plan to add an entire handbook section on how the build works now and some of these new features that was, became apparent that we're missing something like that. We don't have a handbook section on how to actually write a make file. So I'm going to try and add that. I'll probably write some journal articles about all of this. Uh, I want to add in some library link testing, which uh, for linking a library, you only want to bring in dependencies that you actually need and not too much. Baptiste has gone, done a lot of this work already, but I want to add in uh, test at build time. We added something like this at Isilon, which has worked out really well. And it was just using the check link script and also building libraries with no one defined. This can break modules that depend on their loader to provide them a symbol, and it can break libraries that have cyclic dependencies. Those are just special cases, but in general, libraries are only linking what they need, so we should assert this. Uh, so cross builds, as I said earlier, is for building binaries that you cannot run. Uh, I want to do cross OS builds, so building from OS X or Linux. This gets requested a lot at my work because most of our developers are running a Linux desktop and they want to build the kernel at least. Uh, there's really 
Fundamentally, there's not that much we need to do. We just need to expand lib legacy to provide all the FreeBSD isms uh, of libc to Linux so they can build all of our, uh, our functions and use them for the build tools. NetBSD pretty much already does this. They have this huge libcompat library that they build. Uh, and then for building on much older releases, so for our Clang release currently requires libc++11 to build Clang. So you need to have a recent compiler to even build the tree currently. To fix that, we would have to build two or three compilers and bootstrap our way up to building the latest Clang. I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, so ports cross build. I have a lot of stuff here, but I'm out of time. The, the gist is that it's not going to happen for the entire tree. You're going to have to use QEMU to build for other architectures. If you're only building for, say, 10 ports or 20 ports, you can do that. It's a lot of work. You really need to uh, have config.site files for your target. And the reason I'm looking at this is that at Islon, we're building 1FS from FreeBSD. We have reasons for doing that as opposed to building on 1FS. And we have a lot of user land that depends on ports to run ports to build that user land. So we are running 1FS binaries from FreeBSD using a kernel module to provide ABI compatibility. And we want to get away from that, obviously. It is ugly. Yes, it's very ugly. Uh, and ultimately, <laughs> So um, I think I'll just put all this stuff in an article since I'm out of time. But for cross-building ports, a lot of things are going to get built twice. And that's, that's just how it's expected. Uh, I've pretty much got cross-building uh, prototype working with Isilon's code base using dirt apps. This allows a nice unified build where I can build user land and ports all in one dependency graph, one phase. So I can have uh, ports that depend on base and have base depend on ports. and vice versa, and everything, everything just builds. Um, this, this brings about, about a lot of problems in the ports tree because it expects that local base is where it can run files from. But with dirt apps, we're staging the target stuff into one directory, and we're staging host stuff into a different directory. So local base is going to be user local, but really you want a host base to tell it where are files that it can run. The, the ports framework needs a lot of work to actually run uh, cross-compiling. Uh, so the autoconf ports, you can pass the target tuple for what you're building to it. And it generally works, but a lot of autoconf scripts will run a test that it just compiled to see if a function works, whatever works, whatever works means. Uh, so you have to provide it that information to tell it, yes, my get time of day works on this architecture, or no, it doesn't work. You can either do that through a config.site or passing it in the environment. And this is one of the annoyances with cross-building is there's just a lot, there's going to be a lot of things to maintain. Perl requires that you have an SSH documented, that you need a SSH session to a target system to build it. There's a cross-perl project. Basically, you just need to provide a config.sh Python claims to only support Linux for cross-building. Vapti says he got it working. I need to follow up with him. Um, so what you really need to do is go on a target system, generate the config.site using the, the cache mechanism, and then you can just provide that from your, in your source tree for, for later building. And you'll have to maintain that and update those as your target changes over time. Uh, some tools, some ports like develop get text, just like the build tools in build world, will build a tool during the build, and then run that tool. And so uh, they use dot slash to do that. So if you actually get ports cross-building working, you have to patch that port to not use dot slash, but to run your staged host tool version of that. So there's a lot of work to get ports cross-building working for, for you. It'll never happen for FreeBSD without QMU. I've already said this. It's, it's not really going to happen. Uh, and ports also has no bootstrap mechanism. So there's no way to, so building from Linux is, is probably even more not going to happen because we can't guarantee that we're running the BMake that we want to run or all the other host tools that maybe ports depends on or the latest package or things like this. Are there uh, any questions? Angie?
So um, the question was about uh, using a cross tool chain or to rooting into a host environment. So a cross tool chain for ports doesn't help that much because autoconf is still going to want to know whether get time of day works, and the tool chain doesn't provide that information. Um, as for chrooting, so the, the strategy I've taken so far with dirt apps, I, I think I actually do need to move to using a, a chroot to work around a lot of the ports problems. Ports has a chroot feature built in, so I could pretty much make it build this stuff in a chroot. But we can we can talk more later. We're running low on time. Yeah, straight, straight compiling something with a cross tool chain or target flags works fine. Um, I've, I've, I've got several dozen ports building perfectly fine before I hit some of the problems I hit. So a lot of ports really do just work. Are there any other questions? Fred? Uh, 1FS, so we have 64-bit inodes. So that, that impacts uh, struct durant, struct stat. We've made some other changes in there. So um, if we have a 1FS binary that expects struct durant and struct stat to be a certain way and it makes a syscall, it's just going to get junk back from, from get dur entries. And so it's, it's still AMD64. And this is why QEMU doesn't help us, is we're not, we don't need a different architecture. We need a different ABI. We want to make syscalls that have different struct sizes. <coughs> Okay, I made yeah, maybe Kimu would help. I I'll, I'll have to look into that. Any other questions? Like a lie? So uh, with uh, your devs build, uh, you could enable it uh, by default for people in the build team if you uh, separate it uh, like the uh, bootstrap uh, build that creates uh, main file dependent files in the build tree, which you can then check in. But if any of those things are set and you're not bootstrapping, then the, if you maintain the main file dependent uh, Well, yeah. so the, the comment is that if we could move the make file depend, um, sorry to cut you off, we're just very low on time. We're over by 10 minutes. Uh, the problem would be that if you don't already have the make file depend that matches what options you're using, yeah. then things won't build. Uh, your dependencies don't, won't get built before you're building the thing that needs it. In practice, if you hammer uh, a directory like a couple of times with no default options, it you, will yeah, you'd have to build several times. It's not wouldn't be very user friendly. But once you have the bootstrap from a tree, then you're just good to go with all of your non-default options, and they'll be maintained. Yeah, there's there's some strategies for that. Anything else? We can talk more later too. Uh, eight minutes on a not build. That just means that I haven't changed anything. Type make build world, and it only took eight minutes. And I. I Where's the time going? Oh, that's that's all tree walks. Make object. Make install, because it's installing everything to world temp still. It's still, I haven't added in those cookies yet. So it's still visiting all the libraries and all the includes and installing those again into world temp. There's overhead for bmake processing the meta files because it's statting all the files that it's in there to see if anything changed. Before some recent performance improvements to bmake, the not build was 47 minutes. So it's, it's been improved a lot. Final question? You made all of our lives. Thank <laughs> you.